Hello and welcome to This Week, a podcast that brings you conversation about Africa in the news, from pop culture to politics, from the comical to the serious. We bring you controversial news and teams with a fresh, educational, informative and diverse perspective and challenge long-standing beliefs and ways of thinking and doing things. My name is Eva and I'm your host for today. Make sure to subscribe to Leaders of Africa this week in your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. We are on Apple iTunes, Google Podcasts, and more. Engage with us in the Leaders of Africa Discord community. Tell us what news is on your mind this week. We do have some exciting news for you about this week. Yes, that's right. In the new year, we are getting a new name for the This Week podcast. Next episode, we will be the Afroscape podcast. Same discussion of themes inspired by the news. Same ways to watch and listen, including the same podcast feed. As Afroscape, we will be welcoming guest panelists to the regulars, more points of view and perspectives for a survey of the landscape of Africa. That is Afroscape. Wonderful, Peter. We are excited for the Afroscape era. Let's get started. We have so many things ongoing in Africa, including explosion in Ghana, local rice production in Nigeria, and the African Cup of Nations competition that is currently being hosted by Cameroon. But let's hear from our panelists in this week. I'm joined by Violet, Peter, and Ghana. Good to see you all. Let's start with you, Violet. What is on your mind? Good to see you too, Eva. And I'm so excited about the Afroscape name. (laughs) But anyway, (laughs) what's on my mind today is a story that's rather sad. So like you said, in the news this week, we do have explosions that happened in Ghana. And so a truck carrying explosives for a gold mine collided with a motorcycle yesterday, which was Friday in Apiache, a town in Ghana. And it caused a fire, which then turned into an explosion 15 minutes later. Unfortunately, this explosion killed 13 people and injured about 59. It flattened homes, it decimated roofs, and at least 380 people are without shelter currently. And many are still buried under the rubble. And of course, there's the overwhelming stench of corpses, both human and animal. So Apiata is a small residential town with a population of no more than 10,000. And most of the people who live there are farmers and miners. So for this truck that was carrying the explosives, the rider of the motorcycle that collided with the truck died, unfortunately. The truck driver managed to escape with minimal injuries. And... On a happier note, if you could say that, he managed to warn school children and residents to flee, which then eventually helped reduce uh, the the, the number of injuries and deaths, and he ended up saving lives. And the explosives were being delivered to a nearby mine, uh, gold mine named Chirano Gold Mines, which is about 87 miles or about 147 kilometers from the scene of the blast. So that was a really, really unfortunate incident. The military did join the police to help with emergency services. And they were asking people to open churches, classroom buildings, and other buildings that had enough space to help accommodate surviving victims. Explosive experts were also on the scene to try and make sure that a second explosion did not happen. So... According to Chirano Gold Mines, they did say that uh, transportation safety measures were followed, but these were undisclosed to the public. And I still can't help wondering what these were, because I think right now they should be disclosed, at least from the research that I did. I wasn't able to see an explication of what safety measures they took, although I know that the, the, the vehicle that the truck that was carrying the explosives did have police escort, but As to whether this police escort was enough, I'm not sure. And a little bit about, uh, it's not the first time that Ghana is having explosions in the country. So in 2015, um, people sheltering from rain at a gas station and nearby pharmacies and shops were killed by an explosion which claimed 150 lives. And uh, this explosion was caused by a leak at a gas station, by a leak in that gas station. And unfortunately, 150 people died. In 2017, at least seven people died and 68 were injured after a tanker exploded at another gas station in a suburb of the capital, Accra. And uh, at that time, the vice president, uh, Mahmoud Baumia, lamented that the explosions had become, and I quote, one too many. 
and he cited uh, eight explosions over the past three years at that time, which was between 2014 and 2017. And as much as I understand that those gas station explosions and others were unrelated to this incident, I think that we should turn back to this particular explosion and weigh the cost of development versus safety. And I understand that the gold mine is bringing economic returns to this small community and to the country at large, but is this company doing enough to ensure the safety of the people and even just the, the operations of this mine? And I want to hear what the team has to say, but I'm pushing that or I'm contending that there has to be accountability from uh, from the mine because the government has agreed to rebuild the community and help people set their homes back up. But I'm arguing that that's not right because it shouldn't necessarily be the government that's supposed to get these things done, but rather the company that should be culpable. That is, if an investigation is held and it finds out that the, the, that the, the mines company was culpable, I do think that the company needs to be held accountable because it's been the one that's been benefiting from this business. And I don't think that the government should necessarily jump into rebuild communities, help these people start up their lives because the government has so many things to do. And I do think this is one of the reasons why most African governments are not really effective because they are overburdened by so many things that they should not necessarily be doing. And so I'm thinking that an investigation and a thorough investigation should be pushed for. And if the company is found culpable, it needs to start uh, giving reparations to these people long before the government starts to give promises of rebuilding the community. So over to you, Tim, yeah. your thoughts. I mean, it's a, it's a very despicable development. And uh, it's been happening in different parts of African countries, including Nigeria, my home country. And uh, one of the things I've always asked, one of the questions I've always asked is this, uh, do we actually do thorough investigation of the causes of these, uh, you know, sad developments? Uh, because sometimes they may have to do with the material conditions of the road. You know, and uh, sometimes it may also have to do whether those that are, you know, the, the mechanism of conveying the, such kinds of explosive, if they meet up with the minimum international standard requirements, you know, maybe something has been compromised in that area. We don't know. They may also have to do with the behavior of road users, you know, either on the part of the driver of that particular truck that was conveying the explosive were they driving, uh, you know, at the required speed limit? Were they conveying in that particular explosive at the required time of the day? Because there should be time specification when you move explosive like this around. You know, it's not something you need to be moving around during the daytime when the road is busy. You know, so we need we need to interrogate further before the government actually steps in. And uh, for this kind of interrogation to be productive, for this kind of interrogation to produce the entire result. We need to get a community involved, the affected community. We need to get, you know, the, the broader civil society involved in this process. And uh, I mean, it has to be an, an extended stakeholder process so that something is not going to be compromised because the civil community, civil society community, they have to ask, you know, they, they have to put to the table the kinds of questions they want to know just like the community itself. The company itself needs to be represented. The government itself needs to be represented. So in that way, we are not responding to the symptoms. The symptoms mm -hmm. is that we lost some life. You know, there was an accident. We need to be responding to the drivers of this particular crisis so that we can address the drivers and pull this kind of development beside us. Otherwise, we may not be doing the right thing without actually doing detailed investigation. And then regarding whether the company should be responsible, you know, for facing the problem, I think we should allow the investigation to determine this. Because the problem might actually be the government. Maybe the government has not put in place the required institutional regulatory environment so required for the companies to do the right thing. We don't know what the issues are. From that institutional perspective, it may be an institutional laxity issue. And for whatever it is, I think there needs to be a holistic approach in terms of response to this issue so that we can find a long-lasting solution 
that will place us on the threshold of averting such a drastic, you know, negative incident from reoccurring in the, in the future. Um, Ghana, I'm glad you raised the point about the time that these explosives were being transported. It was smack in the middle of the day and there is a school nearby and it, it it's just providence that kids were not in school. And just imagine if, if, if the kids were present in school at that time, it would have even been a more sadder story. And I do agree with you when you say that we need to have a holistic investigation into this incident and that it might be government culpability or, you know, institutional culpability on the side of Chirano Minds. I agree. But all I'm saying is that, and this is not just only in Ghana and for this particular incident, but in so many countries, including my own, whereby something happens and the government immediately jumps in to say, we are going to do this. And I'm just thinking to myself, why does the government have to come in and say, we are going to do this before an investigation is held? And many times these in, th these companies are not held liable. And I'm just saying that for better or for worse, if we hold them to much bigger standard of accountability where they know that they can get sued and they will have reparations and it will eat into their margins, then they are going to be a lot more responsible. And even if the government does have to provide a very healthy regulatory environment, companies on their own, every company should have at least a robust regulatory environment framework of its own to protect itself from liability. And I think that's also part of what needs to be investigated with Tirana Mines. So I don't know if it's so much about raising the liability on companies is going to solve the issue. My one fear that uh, in that respect is that most companies may be looking at more of short-term gains rather than the potential issue that may crop up once in a while, right? So if they know they haven't had explosions in 10 years, they're willing to do business in a more risky way and assume that liability that that won't happen, you know, or does happen every 10 years. So I don't know whether um, increasing the ability to sue companies or the liability that companies have to major accidents is going to actually solve the problem. But what I think what will, and I think this relates to this discussion of regulatory um, uh, matters of the state. I think what will is that states have to contribute some amount of money over a long period of time to the regulatory regime that regulates themselves. And I think that allows the state to build capacity in the regulatory area in which they need to do work. And it also provides, a, in a sense, a basis for a fund if there are major infrastructural projects that have to be done, or if there are accidents, there's a fund in which the victims can be paid out of, that companies are paying out on a regular basis. Because if a company is not thinking about this or they view this risk as very small, they're not going to take efforts to mitigate the risk. Right. If they say, well, we've transport uh, explosives all the time and we don't have this in its incident and this is a one off, they're not going to plan and budget around a potential major suit. They just don't think that way. Right. They're trying to get their margins as big as possible. So they have to be contributing on a more regular basis to that regulatory regime. And that means to be clear and transparent, because my one fear um, in these cases is that we're always on sort of the back foot. We're always sort of responding to the crisis. And so these regulations and the and the payments and all of these things are coming out of a crisis mentality. What should be there is a is a very clear regulatory regime that's in place that has been designed um, and vetted by experts such that, you know, we have that environment that companies know how to navigate. So it's clear and transparent to them. And the government knows how to clearly enforce. And there are resources behind that enforcement that are contributed to those who are partaking in that given industry. Right. So I think that may be a really good and healthy approach that solves a couple of different problems around that uh, healthy regulatory environment. Yeah. So, so in addition to that, uh, Peter, uh, because I have a friend uh, who, whose father used to work in one of the mines in the, uh, in Ghana. And uh, there was a time we had a conversation about, uh, you know, how people that work in the mine, how they deal with a lot of life threatening issues. And uh, without, you know, any regulatory uh, environment actually addressing uh, the need to take the well-being, the health condition of the workers in this mine seriously. And, and that begs this conversation as well. When you know that such delicate 
materials are going to be transported within a particular environment. That begs the need for anticipatory thinking in terms of if this happens, what are the necessary force response emergency structure in place to curtail the magnitude of damage that may arise from such a negative development. You don't have to wait for it to happen before you actually plan for it. And for what, from the response to this particular drastic incident, there is no evidence that there was such a thing in place. So meaning that the government itself may have failed in its responsibility up in issue planning to put such a system in place that enables them to respond and curtail such a, you know, a negative incident from consuming the life of community and from consuming the life of people. So when you don't plan to mitigate crisis, crisis comes to consume people. Then you respond to the outcome of the crisis itself. That seems to be something that is ought to be. So the instant investigation should go beyond the immediate, the direct and indirect causes of this particular incident, it, it should be taken to the, to the level of examining whether the communities that are located within certain radius of the mine, whether they are protected from such negative incidences. We are just aware of what. There may be other ones that are happening. They didn't even make it to the news. And the communities might have been, you know, dealing with this in silence all in the name of that maybe some members of the community are getting employed, but in the long term, they may be dealing with life-threatening health issues. They may be dealing with some forms of disability, because when you live very close to the mind, you are most likely to have problems with hearing. You are most likely to even have problems, you know, with, with having to talk in a very, you know, soft sound, because it might be that you need to be shouting for people to hear you otherwise. Because I live very close to the mind, uh, there was no myself living close to my friends of mine, living close to the mine when I was in Nigeria. You know, they live very close to the mine, and they had, they had a lot of health issues that they were dealing with. So, building on that, I can begin to map what is happening in Ghana, and the need for the government to be sensitive to the, some issues. And if the government is insensitive, I I I I, I won't be surprised because it requires the people to be sensitive to those issues make them national conversation talking point so that the need for can be done for it by the government face of face their regulatory power and then being you know the one that speaks for the interests of the public good i mean this is one thing that i feel that needs to be given more attention going forward on this issue yeah i, I just hope that this become a wake-up call for the government to put in more measures to um, prevent this in the future because um, as valid indicated Explosions has been taking place in Ghana most frequently, and it's becoming like we're becoming um, numb to it now, right? Because in 2015, I was in Ghana when that explosion happened, claiming the life of 150 people, and we felt like this is going to lead to a massive change in policies, in regulation, and even the way um, people conduct themselves, you know. But it looks like not much was done because. It happens anyway. So at the end of the day, the government will make so much noise about it. People will make so much noise about it. Then they will forget. Then every, everything returns to normal. So for, for me, my point is, at the end of the day, is the people. It's us that these things affect. They are, we have family members that will be affected by this. We have friends that will be affected by it. A whole community will be destroyed because of some of these things. So we have to hold the government accountable. We don't have to... Um, assume that because the government says they are going to do something about it, they are going to do something about it. At the end of the day, they are going to write a big report. Investigation is going to be done. They are going to write a big report. They are going to come up with recommendations and things that needs to be done. Even recommendation as to how the government should deal with a company. But it's, it's going to gather dust somewhere. You know, so we have to step up in requiring the government to do some of these things. You know, this thing has been happening. 2017, a friend of mine sent me a petition to sign because there was a gas explosion closer to the University of Ghana. And we were sad about it because that is where we all went to school. And even my sister, I was here and my sister called me and said that 
um, she felt the explosion at home. They live about 15 minutes from where the gas explosion happened. And she heard it from home and she was telling me about it. And I told this friend that I'm not going to sign this because it's not going to get anywhere. And it became an argument that I don't support things. I'm like, the only way for us to if um, to cause the government to effectuate some of this change is for us to hold the government accountable. You know, if we pass by a filling station and we see that there's something wrong, we the citizens should be able to speak out. So I hope that this is going to be a wake up call. I pray that it doesn't happen again because this community is completely destroyed. There is nothing that can be done. And it will take years for the government to clean it up because the government said that they are going to clean it up. Clean it up involve making sure that there is no hazard in the soil for the people and things like that. It involves a lot of chemical cleaning because this is an explosion. The explosion came with different kind of chemical combination and things like that. The road that passed through the community was splitted into two. You may think it was an earthquake if you see it and the whole community was flattened. So I hope that this is a wake up call for the government to do something. I also hope that the Ghanaian community, after making the noise, we will not be quiet. We, will, we want to see measures. We want to see things done. And besides, there is also so much indiscipline on our roads now, you know, because I heard it was, accident was caused by a motor driver and another, those three wheel cars. So what happened? We have to investigate what, what happened. And also there was a police escort. So what were the police doing when they saw that um, that three wheel um, vehicle has hit the driver and the motorcycle went under the car? Did they alert the driver to stop or do something about it? So there is so much that we need to do, but we the people don't have to be silent. The fact that the government is going to do it, yes, they are going to put in a community a committee to investigate. The Ghana government is good at doing that. They are going to write big reports, but the aftermath in terms of the implement, implementation, in terms of um, mitigating some of those effects, that is what we want. So I am um, treating the Ghanaian um, um, public because at the end of the day it is us that affect to gun on mm -hmm. the government to speak out to make sure that these things do not happen again we have to hold the government accountable actually Eva I'm glad you mentioned that and if you don't mind me just adding this to what you've said is on top of even just holding the government accountable I think the one thing that we need to watch out for and if we need to do even speak out against is the politicization of all these incidents that happen. So, for example, this has happened and you'll find our politicians, instead of doing the needful and, you know, <laughs> finding remedies, they'll politicize it. You'll find the NDC trying to gain political capital and you'll find people also on the NPP side doing the same, blaming each other. And then it just turns into a whole political mind game. And again, in the end, it's the people who are the collateral damage. That is really a good point, Violet. Um, let's continue this conversation on our Discord community. So I hope our viewers will join us. Now let's come to you, Ghana. What is on your mind? Yeah, thank you so much, Eva. And uh, from these uh, very unfortunate incidents uh, in Ghana, we have something positive to talk about in Nigeria. It's been in the nude world over. You know, there was a rice pyramid that was recently launched in Abuja by President Mahmoud Buhari as one of the landmark achievements of his administration in the bid to make Nigeria self-sufficient in rice production. You know, it's considered the largest rice pyramid in Africa. And, uh, you know, people might have been wondering, why is this very important? Uh, this becomes important because uh, one of the biggest, you know, rice consuming countries in the world is Nigeria. And uh, for some time, we've always been dependent on importing rice from different parts of the world, you know, to our country, to feed our people. And uh, that has always been having a lot of negative consequences, including on the economy and the ability of people to actually afford rice, which is a major staple in the country. There are some families that they even eat rice twice in a day. So it's a major consumer household staple in the country. So in the bid to address this problem of dependency on the importation of rice, various administrations in the country, as far back as the time of uh, President Lucia Guna Basanjo, they've been trying to address the issue of increasing the capacity of farmers to uh, produce more rice in the country locally. 
and uh, President Jonathan Goodluck also gave it some uh, market attention. But under the administration of uh, President Muhammad Buhari, they've been able to make more gains in the area, in the area of uh, increasing domestic rice production. And one of the symbolic way of demonstrating this is the rice pyramid, uh, which, according to them, uh, is a way they are going to, you know, crash down the price, the local rise of price, which has been skyrocketing in the country, which I consider to be a very dubious framing. Because when it comes to the rise of, uh, you know, rice per bag in the local market, it, it has little to do with the rice pyramid. It's about other important factors that they are not speaking about. But by and large, it's a major success story that the presidency of Muhammad Buhari is projecting. So I'd like to know what you guys think about this because you've read about it, you've been discussing about it. What does this seems to communicate to you in terms of uh, the progress being made by Nigeria in the area of domestic rice production? Um, I think this is a, a great idea and I, I actually like it because Africans are consuming a lot of rice and most of the rice that we consume are being imported. Actually, it was last year that they started also promoting um, consumption of local rice in Ghana because most of the rice we, we are consuming even in Ghana is coming from Thailand and other places. So if Nigeria is doing this, I think it's really great. Um, it's going to reduce, as the, um, the president said, dependence on rice importation because Nigerians consume a lot of rice and not just Nigeria, a lot of places in Africa as well. So I like the fact that the government is um, encouraging local production as well as local consumption. But my challenge is that, is this going to reduce importation? Because some people may prefer to still eat the imported rice because it's more polished, it's more nice, it's more tasty. So has the government put in measures to ensure that there is something like a ban on rice importation or even the importation of rice um, is reduced? I want to hear that from Ghana before we add it. Yeah, yeah thank you so much for those very brilliant questions. Uh, I mean, regarding whether uh, it's going to reduce importation of, uh, of rice into the country, uh, what I can assure you is that uh, it may and it may not, uh, because it's not a question of one plus one equals two, uh, because there are many factors that determine whether people will continue to import rice into the country or not. One, to, to most of those stakeholders that are involved in this particular value chain is about what is more profitable. The fact that you are producing rice locally does not mean that it is profitable for those that are involved in the business of distribution because profitability is a function of energy. It's a function of the local production factors. You know, if the production cost of producing rice locally is on the high side, that will impact the landing cost of rice that is available for distribution for consumers. So for a distributor who wants to invest in that, that kind of, you know, activity, they have to look at the profit. So is it profitable to them? So meaning that for us to actually discourage importation of rice in the long term, we need to reduce the production cost of local rice and make it competitive so that that naturally discourage people from importing rice into the country. When you place a ban, it's just an artificial mayor that does not necessarily address issues that are related to increasing production costs, which has been an issue. Despite the fact that the government has gone the way of, you know, banning this importation of rice into the country, the prices of local rice has been going up. Because another thing is this, if the rice is profitable for those that are involved in the distribution of rice, the other factor that needs to be considered is the affordability by the consumers themselves. If it is profitable, we also have to address the affordability perspective, which is not the case currently. We've been having an increase in local rice production. As we produce more rice locally, unfortunately, the, rice of, uh, the, the, the price of rice, of a bag of rice in the local market, in our local market, they've been increasing tremendously, astronomically. And that, 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 should, be, that should be leading us to ask some questions in terms of what do we need to do differently in terms of our you know, effort as increasing local rice production. And that is why the issues of food, food availability, food affordability shouldn't be looked at from a linear perspective of you fix this, other problems are fixed. No, 
is a system, a complicated issue that requires attention to multifaceted issue at the same time. We have to get it right on the demand side. We also have to get it right on the supply side. Unfortunately, the government seems to be fixated on increasing local rice production without paying attention to other important variables in the equation. So when I'm looking at the story, to your point, Ghana, the Farmers Association, uh, that is the Rice Farmers Association of Nigeria, or RIFON, has suggested that this uh, initiative is going to actually lower the price of rice in the market, right? So they're hoping that consumption will increase as it lowers the price in the market. In addition to this, one other piece of this story is that this uh, initiative was in part supported by the government as well, right? So there was the anchor borrowers program that the president of Nigeria was emphasizing that um, other farmers should get a, become a part of, right? So this is, I think, a powerful initiative. We may disagree with the extent of it or how it's uh, being carried out, but I think it's a useful um, use of, of government power, of state power, to enhance agricultural production. And this is not unlike most countries around the world that subsidize agriculture, that ensure that their domestic markets are able to provide food for oneself. That's one area of the global economy that's very clear that countries want control of, and they're unwilling to give control of that to to others, right? So I think that's a a good start. Um, The question that I had about this story, this these these sort of technical or policy issues aside, is that when this came out, the 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 rice pyramids was was announced and the event took place. A lot of people were beginning to joke about it across uh, society, right? They were putting Instagram posts of you know the rice pyramids, or they were creating their own little rice pyramids on their own <laughs> plates, and they were going and it, it, they were going to send it around to people, and it was going viral. And I'm curious to know, Ghana, when that was taking place, so this viral aspect of it on social media, was that because people were intrigued by what was going on or were people using this as a as a form of critique or were they what, what were they trying to say by these uh, uh, by these uh, posts that they were sharing? I, I think it's all of that, Peter. And the reason is this, uh, Nigerians are humorous people. You know, they even when they are suffering, they like to make fun out of it. And uh, the other part of it is another way of just uh, laughing at the government. And uh, and that takes me back to the statement that uh, you said, the Farmers Association, they made, you know, I respect their opinion and uh, they are a big stakeholder in the, in, in the sector. But, you know, their voices could also be political as well. It could be politicized. Uh, because uh, what I've always told people is this, let them define what a pyramid is. It's a storage when they say a rice pyramid, it's a rice storage. And, uh, and that begs this question. It's story, a storage is definitive of rice, of, of, the, of the reduction in the price of a particular commodity. That is not necessarily true. They may play the role. They may play a role in reducing the, 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 the price of a particular commodity, but that is never going to be automatic. And there is not even that evidence that storages are enough to depress the prices of a particular commodity. But that is assuming that other commodities, other same products are not getting into the market. Because at the end of the day, it's about a lot of factor. The cost of getting the rice from the storages to the point of sales. If the cost is on the high side, that cost is going to be transferred to the consumers. That is one thing. And the other thing that people need to be aware of is this. Storages could also mean that the quality of a particular product, of a particular commodity, get compromised if the storages do not attend to issues of quality. Because when you put food under a particular storage system, if the storage systems were not the optimal condition required for you to preserve the quality of that particular product, the quality may depreciate in time. And once the quality depreciates in time, that may also affect whether you're able to sell that particular, the marketability of that particular product. So people are just talking about storages. Rice pyramid is a form of storages. So what are the mechanisms in place to make sure that the storage contributes to depressing the existing market prices of rice in the country? 
that has not been elucidated, elucidated. That has not been explained to the consuming public how that is going to take place. And this is not just one thing that you do by focusing on one side of the equation at the expense of the other side of the equation. It's a systemic issue. Everything needs to go simultaneously, combined together. Other mechanisms need to be in place for the price of rice to be depressed in the, in, in the market. And that is the, one of the reasons why people are mocking the government. That if you are talking about rice pyramid, we can make pyramid out of what we have. Some people are even mocking the government negative, like maybe they mm-hmm. are in some, you know, wooden materials beneath the rice pyramid and all of these things, you know. I uh, saw that. Yeah. I, I saw that. People were discussing, <laughs> what were the rice bags on? What is really in there? You know, that there were all these stories that were circulating there. Exactly. I saw that too. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, the, of course, the rice will definitely be on something. There will be something to support the rice underneath, and it was going to be a wood to just support it. So, um, Valid, do you have um, do you have a comment? Yeah, I, I mean, on my mind, I'm just thinking about how they are going to affect uh, quality control. I know that Ghana has mentioned something to do with quality control, but I think the angle from which I'm coming at, and Ghana, you may be the best person to answer this question, is the quality in terms of the actual product, not even when it gets to maybe storage or transportation or things of that nature. So when I lived in Nigeria briefly, I don't know, probably you've heard of the rubber rice. I know that at some point I did eat that rice. I I, I did not know at first what it was, but it did feel strange. Like I was chewing actual rubber and it was tasteless and rubbery. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> so that is a rubber rice. I'd never heard of that concept before. And I was like, ah, okay. So <laughs> Ghana, yeah. you might be the best person to answer this question. But when it comes to things like that, again, cutting costs of production, like you said, and, you know, cutting corners and all of these things. Does the government have plans, you know, to curtail certain things like that? Because I know, for example, if someone has maybe a higher socioeconomic status, they might not want to take risks and maybe end up eating rubber rice and say, I'm going to stick with the imported rice. But then if that is closed off, are there measures in place to make sure we don't eat rubber rice again? It was an interesting experience. I've never forgotten. it. <laughs> I have some friends who have invested into the, in the rice valuation in Nigeria. And uh, one of the areas where the federal government is not doing enough is, uh, you know, investing into the rice processing. That is where this issue actually takes place. You know, they need to make more funds available so that the processed rice in the country, the quality can improve tremendously. And indeed, in some part of that particular value sheet, We've been seeing some very great products coming out of it, but it seems it's just a few that are really doing well. So that is one area where the government needs to do more because the focus mostly for now has been on increasing the production volume. And even when you go to the issue of production volume, Nigeria may be consuming its future. That's another argument for the people because rice production comes with tremendous amount of water utilization. And I want to know the study that has been done in the country in terms of the amount of water that is going into rice production and how much of that increase in local rice production is sustainable in the long term. No such study as is existing anywhere that I know of. I've been speaking with stakeholders that are we not consuming our future? Because the tendency to think that increasing the particular local production of a particular food is good for a country is just too, is just too simplistic, reductionist. It's not accounting for the fact that the water that you use in production of a particular commodity is not going to increase. It's reducing. It's a finite resource. And so other resources involved in the production of a particular commodity. So you may even do better in the long term that you import certain percentage of your local rice production rather than move towards self-sufficiency in terms of rice production. Because you don't have to look about the volume alone. You also have to look at the capacity to continue to produce locally at that at that level if it is not possible in the long term if it is not sustainable in the long term then it means it should not be a viable policy to go with i like to stop here so that we can move to other issue we can continue the discussion on our discourse community and on some other platform through which you know we have created yeah that, that is right ghana so peter what is on your mind so i guess i am doing this sports segment for today 
Uh, AFCON is on my mind. And those of you who know, I love sports. I have been following AFCON as I assume a lot of you have and our listeners have. And we are now into the next stage of AFCON here. We've moved from the group stage to the playoff stage. And uh, based on our group here, we, we have only one of us moving on, and that would be Ghana's Nigeria. Uganda, unfortunately, did not make it into the tournament, the Cranes. And uh, Eva, I'm sorry to let you know, and I know you already know this, uh, but Ghana was knocked out of the tournament unceremoniously by Comoros. So let's look at uh, the state of affairs in AFCON. And there are a couple of strong teams that are really emerging now. I think the Nigerian team is uh, both a surprise and not a surprise, but certainly a surprising start given the three wins that they had in their group, including a win over one of the big teams in the competition, and that is Egypt. So I want to point that out. We also see a really great start for uh, Cameroon as well, being the host. So the, the country is really excited about the team and what's going on. People are following it. The government also put out a notice that people can't work after a certain time of the day. Um, unfortunately, that's frustrating some people because some people had plans to work in the afternoon in state institutions, including universities. And now the universities, which are some of them are in exam period, had to restructure their whole exam period because the government made that edict. Right. That aside, um, they are following it. And Cameroon is doing well. But I also want to highlight the plight of the small countries and the success of the quote unquote small countries. And when I mean small countries here is I'm just talking about population as well as the physical side of the country. I want to point out the success, for example, of Cape Verde uh, in their group moving on, as well as, as I mentioned before, the unceremonious knockout of Ghana, the, the team that looked at the defensive end, having no uh, skill at the defensive end, completely allowing teams to just walk right into the box. And they allowed Comoros in their final game to just walk into the box. And Comoros is moving on. So another island country. And I'll have you know that if you look at leaders of Africa's uh, icon or logo, you'll notice that we include the island countries that are often missed uh, by other logos that are there, including Comoros, including Cape Verde. And they're moving on here. And the final couple countries I want to point out here is the success of Malawi, success in their group of Malawi. And they're going to be coming up against the heavyweights Morocco in the next round. And then finally, we can't forget a newcomer to the AFCON tournament, and that is the country of the Gambia. And folks in the Gambia are super excited for the success in their group state. They had a phenomenal success in some tough matches um, that, uh, that they played in before. So it's a really exciting tournament where you see some of those dominant teams, such as Algeria, which... If you listen to the recording, I was suggesting we're going to go pretty far and deep in the tournament, have been knocked out of the tournament. But the success of these countries with small populations, small size, really showing that they have that prowess on the pitch uh, and providing that uh, high level of excitement. So I want to turn to you, Ghana, since you are, you, you know, <laughs> we see Nigeria succeeding really greatly in the tournament, <laughs> uh, buoyed by some support from, from all over the world uh, and the national team. So tell us, what's going on? What's the, what's the buzz in Nigeria, seeing the success I mean, of three wins out of three? I mean, people felt that uh, that was unexpected uh, because uh, it's not because of uh, lack of, uh, you know, the quality players that can do the job, uh, because we have not always gotten it right with the coaching crew. And uh, surprisingly, they've been playing together as a team, not as individuals. And I think uh, part of that could be because, uh, you know, they really want to make some progress during the World Cup. Uh, everybody has been surprised. Uh, personally, I've refused to be paying attention to those boys uh, because I've been seeing sports as a distraction in Africa. You know, I, I rather want a situation whereby they focus more on developing our educational system whereby they pay more attention, you know, to addressing some very fundamental uh, develop, other development challenges on the continent. But it's a necessary distraction, if you ask me, because myself, I'm a footballer, I'm a football fan, and, uh, but, uh, you know, but they've been doing well, honestly. Let's give it to those young boys. They've been doing well, and uh, hopefully they are able to sustain it so that at least we can win the Nations Cup for another time. I'm so sorry, Eva, that uh, you guys got bumped out of the game. Yeah, yeah. But I think, listen to me, Peter, if you ask me this. 
there is nothing like a small country in football. It's about the team. It's not even mm. about the big names. If you have the big names, PSG is sovereign now. They have the best of talent in the world in one team. They have Messi. They have Mbappe. Just name it. They have Nima. They have the top talent in the world. Some of the top leading talent that can make first 11, at least from the PSG team. You can get up to four people, five people that will make number one world 11 in the world. But what is the outcome? They are still dealing with the inability to operate as a team. So if those smaller countries can do better playing together as a team, they get better results. And that's what we've been seeing on the pitch. Football is not about the population of your country. It's about the chemistry, the ability to work together, die together for a team, and then, you know, you kill together for the team as well. And mm-hmm. I think those smaller countries have been killing together, they've been dying together, and they're getting results. Speaking of killing together and dying together for the team, I'd like to point out the hypocrisy of the Ghanaian people uh, when it comes to uh, burning the coach at the stake and crying, crying bloody murder <laughs> for them being put out of the of the tournament. Because I, I mean, the coach came in just I think three months or so to 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 the tournament, and then they expected him to. I mean, perform miracles. I mean, that is unrealistic because the coach needed to have spent a lot more time with the team. And I mean, he has delivered for the country before. And then, I mean, you just expect him to pull a rabbit out of your heart at the last minute. I think that is unrealistic and people need to manage their expectations if they wanted him to do better. They should have brought him on at a much earlier stage. And so, yeah, when it comes to killing and dying for the team, I would like to just point out that part. Actually, the coach has been sacked. And it's it's funny in Ghana, too. I'm glad you raised this, Violet. But politics is sort of involved in sports in some countries, right? And uh, I think this goes a little bit to Ghana's point about, you know, the importance of uh, enhancing development and the role of government and the role of, uh, of the country and the, the efforts and focusing on that. I agree with that, right? That's where our attention should be. But we can also have fun and, and have a good time with sports. The problem becomes when the government gets intertwined with the the success of a national team, right? Um, This is something very separate, right? Yes, you could say it has to do with development Mm. in the sports sector and enhancing the quality of play in the country as an industry in the country, right? As economic opportunities for people creating an entertainment industry. And I understand that. But it's just the national team. And there are plenty of national teams that don't succeed, but there isn't this sort of a dust up of political discussions, right? I remember a couple of years ago, the Italian team in the last World Cup didn't make it into the World Cup. And, you know, it, and that's what it was. Whose fault was it? Well, it was the, the team's fault, right? The players and the coaches and all of that, right? They weren't going to the Italian government and saying, well, the Italian government's not doing enough for uh, the Italian football team, right? And so uh, th- there's that. And also it's complicated when governments try and take claim for the success when the team is successful. And they sit out there, they start giving them a lot more money, which probably they should be paid on a more regular basis, or they start doling out properties and houses and all of this kind of thing, right? This is the problem that I have is that when it gets mixed up with the, the fate of the government, where people start saying, well, I don't like the, the Ghanaian government now because their football team's not doing well, right? That's preposterous. In that case, focus on the success or failure of the government on development, right? Leave that side and do care that they are promoting sports in the country, opportunities in the entertainment sector, right? So if you're coming at it from that angle, fine. But if it's about the success or failure of a team that's put together that practices a few weeks out of the year and plays a handful of games during the year, you know, I don't I don't appreciate that as much. Perhaps Eva has a different thought on that though. I um, actually <laughs> agree with you um, because um, the Ghana football um, has become politicized. I remember in 2014, actually people are bringing this up. The president of Ghana, when he was campaigning to become the president, went on Twitter to write, no water, no electricity, no petrol, no money, no jobs, no mercy, no World Cup victory, Ghana. <laughs> so when he said that, people were like, what is going on? So he campaigned saying that he's going to make Ghana qualify for the World Cup and bring in World Cup victory. So that is when politicization happened. 
<laughs> and also the Ghana Football Association is going to a lot of challenges. They've had several coaches um, that have come and gone. Um, so this coach was a last minute option for them. And this coach has actually uh, been a coach for Ghana before and actually led Ghana to um, the World Cup and went, and, and went into um, the quarterfinals of the World Cup, right? So Coach Milo is not new to Ghana, but the truth of the matter is that they want him to perform wonders in three months, which was not possible. At the same time, too, he wasn't having all the players together. You know, these players are playing with teams abroad and all over. So by the time they came together, they had like a week um, to practice as a team to go and play for this tournament. So I do not blame him. Personally, I do not. Because he didn't have all the resources, all the things, and even the players he needs on the onset um, to do all this work um, together. But it the truth is that we have to start investing in our local teams so that when there is tournament like that, we will not always depend on teams that are playing ab abroad for them to be released a week to um, the competition to come and practice and play. No, that, that wouldn't um, produce the resources that you need, right? Because all these players, some are playing in leagues and it's also January when uh, most leagues are trying to win to stay in the competition. So. For instance, the Premier League, they took forever to release some of their players. Some of their players left a week before the competition started. And how many times or how many um, days do they have to be able to practice with the whole team, to build that team synergy, to play as a team? So most of the time, the big names um, in the Premier League, when they go back um, to play, you will see that they struggle a little bit to get form to actually play together as a team because they've not really worked out. They've not really practiced much with the team. So I feel like we need to start investing in the local team that we have um, in our country so that we can also depend on some of these local players to play for us during this competition instead of always depending on these players playing abroad to come together, to come home and play for us when most of the time they are released like within a week before the competition. Building the local league, it's a very important thing. But uh, you know what? I've come to realize it's not a thing of one plus one equals two. Uh, because the moment, uh, you know, you build a local league, nobody wants to continue to play locally, except it is super profitable for them. So the guy that is a star locally, the next thing is that he wants to go abroad. So you continue to produce for the export market where, you know, people get to uh, get paid massive amount of salary. So this is another constraining factor that we need. We really need to consider, you know, uh, in our deliberation of building locally. When we build locally, uh, their incentive structure to keep them from within, because some of this league that people call Premiership, I tell people Premiership is a local league. Serie A is a local league over there. Uh, La Liga is a local league. Uh, the Super League in uh, in Turkey is also a local league. So the people from that country. You know, so and what makes it attractive to people is because they've been able to develop their local league, not in terms of quality of play, the feed, but in terms of the amount of money that people get to pay for, you know, signing up with a particular uh, club. But I have a big issue with this. You know, the kinds of money that folks get paid in football is distracting people from committing to, you know, academic and the Air Force. If you know that you can be playing soccer, kicking ball around, you know, we all play good soccer. You know, some of us could have even been professionals if that is the option we wanted to follow in life. Uh, but the fact is that the money that people get paid in soccer could be depriving people from committing their future to the writing on the continent. And that is why I don't talk so much about developing, you know, uh, the local league and all of these things. Because rather than people getting to study economics, developing an economic model for Africa that it's well suited to the continent, rather than for people to become investors, you know, people that will be developing, creating new technologies for us on the continent, they may get easily distracted because of the salary. Because they pay a humongous amount of money. And that is why I have a different perspective about sport in terms of what African government should be committing to it and what we should not be committing for, into it. Let's just leave it as a form of leisure, you know, not something to be putting too much attention into. Otherwise, it may distract us and take us further from addressing our many development predicaments. Um, Ghana, I have to disagree with you. Uh, because also uh, sports also leads to economic development. So we have to put in the right investment. 
and also to create the needed job around sports because yeah, the, there are a lot of talented people and not everyone can become a professor or an engineer. There are some people that <laughs> they can kick the ball really well and that is okay. where they are. So we need to develop this um, to create jobs as well because there's also jobs that comes with um, putting investment in your sports and activities. So we will leave it here for our audience um, to discuss with us massively on um, Discord. Um, so join us on Discord to continue to deliberate on some of these issues. So at this um, um, moment, I would like to thank you for joining us today. We hope you will join us again for next week episode of Leaders of Africa. This week, which will actually become the Afroscape podcast. Make sure to subscribe in your favorite podcast app and on YouTube. We are on Apple iTunes, Google Podcasts and more. And join our Discord community to continue the conversation and follow Leaders of Africa on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and Instagram for all new and great content. And that is it for this week for now. Until next week.